traffic, did you? <laughs> Between that and the red lights. I think it took us almost 20 minutes to get here from our house. Wow. How much start earlier? Check this. I bought this. I bought. I actually bought this one. Uh, it does it, but that's okay. Probably don't have to do something. This one still will work. Well, where is it? I think. Oh, I think I see him. Yeah, but I've got. I'll, I'll get him for closing. Did you check it? Sometimes when it, it's asleep and it, you'll feel it vibrate. There you go. I'll get for you. I'll get for If you can't hear me, raise your hand. Good, okay. Now, uh, due to the nature of things, we're gonna sing from the hymnal tonight, okay? We're gonna start with a brand new song, 810. We're seeing the first, second, and last verse. Hmm. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, he who died, heaven's gate to open wide. He will wash away my sin, let his little child come in. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. I just made it. 810, right? Y'all catching the tune now? All right, let's sing out a little bit. We'll do the last verse. Jesus, take this heart of mine, make it pure and holy thine. Thou hast bled and died for me. I will henceforth live for thee. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. A uh, five hundred and seventy five seven O. Now we will um, I think Jerry has uh, some announcements and then we'll have our opening prayer and after that we will sing five hundred and seven. Thank you so much for coming. I just wanted to share with you some updates that we received on some of those that are not well. And Aubrey, this afternoon, late, texted that he wouldn't be able to be here this evening. Aubrey does have some health issues, and please remember Aubrey in your prayers. Uh, Charlie fills in as well sometimes for singing, and Dawn had... Uh, uh, 
crown that came off her tooth and uh, they were unable to fix that so I believe she's having to have a tooth pulled and he's unable to be with us as well but we have a, a wonderful backup Mike thank you so much appreciate you filling in and uh, appreciate you being here this evening in just a moment Kenneth's going to lead us in a prayer I think everyone hopefully is aware that Connie did have her surgery yesterday and everything went well, but they expect this to be a lengthy recovery as far as getting able to bounce back from this. And she certainly is in need of our prayers and appreciates the prayers that have been shared on her behalf already. But please continue to remember Connie Watts, Eddie, as well with the surgery that he's going to need on his foot uh, having that removed all the way up to the knee is the understanding is certainly in need of our prayers um, nancy harrell and her mother agnes please continue to remember them uh, lisa cummings on the 21st will be going to the doctor to get some information about being set up i believe it is for radiation for her. Uh, Brother Carl Boaz was telling me on the 11th of September he will go as well to uh, see what they're going to be able to do to help him I think with his neck I believe on that procedure. Uh, Jeremy, that's one of the reasons I wanted to get up here before Kenneth uh, leads us in prayer. Marlene I uh, spoke with her late this afternoon as well. Jeremy Stover is home, but th he's not well. Uh, he had some episodes with his heart even after midnight last night, two episodes in particular, and yet they allowed him or dismissed him, and so he's home, but he's not doing well. So remember Jeremy in your prayers and certainly continue to remember Sonia and Marlene and Everett and all the family in your prayers. Um, good to have Tiffany visiting with us tonight. Sandra, always wonderful to see you. Thank you for being here. Kenneth, if you would, if you'll lead us in a word of prayer. Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day you've given us and thank you for the many blessings you bestow upon us every day. And Father, thank you for allowing your Son to come down to die for our sins. Father, at this time we'd like to remember Eddie and Connie, and Aubrey, Lisa Cummins, Jeremy Stover, Carl Boaz, and Dawn who is having a tooth extracted. And Father, we ask that you be with them, be with those that we do not know about at this time. Comfort them, bring them back to their regular state of health. Father, we ask that you be with each and every one of us, that you forgive us of our sins, that we may have a home with you and Father, we, we ask that you accept our worship tonight as it is, as it is meant. Father, we ask that you lead, guide, and direct all of us, for it's in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. <coughs> Would you mark number 272? Please mark number 272. will serve as a hymn of invitation. Following the singing of 570, we'll have a class. So 272 for the invitation. And 570 will be the hymn that we sing before the lesson. Kind of full up here, and I can't figure out where to put the songbook. So... Okay, 570. The first verse, second verse, and the fifth verse. 570. 
Shall we gather at the river where by an angel's feet have trod with its crystal tide forever flowing by the throne of God? Yes, we'll gather at the river, the beautiful, the beautiful river. Gather with the saints at the river that flows by the throne of God. <clears throat> On the margin of the river, washing up its silver spray, we will walk and worship ever all the happy golden day. Yes, we'll gather at the river, the beautiful, the beautiful river. Gather with the saints at the river that flowed by the throne of God. At the smiling of the river, mirror of the Savior's face, saints whom death will never sever, lift their songs of saving grace. Yes, we'll gather at the river, the beautiful, the beautiful river. Gather with the saints at the river that flows by the throne of God. Yeah. As Mike would say, can you hear me? Or as the, as the phone man would say, can you hear me now? <laughs> what is that, Verizon? Can you hear me now? Good to see you this evening. Sorry I'm running late. I'm telling, I was telling Mike that uh, I'm still trying to figure out, get in the habit of doing things here. But one of the things I've figured out is that um, the traffic at 6 o'clock is worse than at 7 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> and so between the traffic and traffic lights, it took me a while to get here longer than I thought. <clears throat> I had ho hoped to talk this evening about uh, the reasons for believing in God, four reasons in particular that I want to give you. And I mentioned to you already that um, I don't want to be showing you any pictures of God or anything like that. You know, we don't have any empirical data, sight, see, touch. So it'll be circumstantial, and, but that's okay because that's very valid reasoning as we've talked about. Using our reasoning, our logic, looking around us in our world and ourselves, you can conclude very concretely that there is God, that he is real. And so we're going to be looking at, but I'm gonna have to put that off uh, a few weeks. I didn't finish up quite what I began, uh, and so I lacked a little bit on that, so I decided I would do that, and I just added a little bit more to it which, made, which is going to make this lesson way too long, I'm sure, before it's all said and done. But anyway, I'm going to try to talk a little bit faster because if I talk faster, you won't know how ignorant I am of what I'm talking about. But also, seriously, um, some things I'm going to breeze over because, quite frankly, I don't know the answers to all of those things. And um, if I did, you probably wouldn't understand what I told you. So <laughs> it's pretty, some of it's pretty complicated. Anyway, so I'm going to try, but I want to try to do as best I can to help you understand some of this th stuff about evolution and about why we believe in God. And my purpose in doing this really is twofold. You could say, well, you're preaching to the choir here. We already believe in God. Yeah, I know that. But number one, it really builds your faith to think the more you think about this and the, so obvious it becomes, the more you realize there is God. He is real and uh, we should be believing in him. And also, we're supposed to be able to give an answer to every man that asketh the reason for the hope that's in us, right? And uh, 1 Peter 3, verse 15, so this hopefully will help you do that. You might not be able to tell all the details, but at least you'll have some general things. You'll remember that you'll be able to say, I know that's not right, 
and I uh, know that there's a better explanation for that. Um, let me just get into it here. One of the things that has always bothered me about evolution, the worst thing, I think, is that they, it's presented so much as being a fact. It's factual, right? And it's taught to our kids as being fact. And uh, most people believe it's a fact. Because after all, the scientists said it was fact. Scientists are never wrong, right? And so it must be right. I think that's one of the reasons that so many young people growing up no longer have an interest in religion because they've been hearing all their life there's no God and they're not really too concerned about it anymore. After all, science has already showed that we all are here by the process of evolution. And so we don't really have to worry about it. But is it really a fact? And I would maintain, I'm going to maintain, that it takes more faith and I don't really like using that word, I would say more wishful thinking to believe in evolution than it does to believe in God. Scientists want us to believe that it's factual and they, you know, they want us to give up. I showed you some of these quotes last week to that effect. Um, but the problem is that evolution is outside the realm of science. Evolution, science deal, the scientific method is what you can see here, touch, taste right now. They can't tell us what happened a million years ago, or it's not that long, 6,000 years ago. And so it falls way short of being able to give us the information that we need. And even they recognize that, the problem there. And so I, as uh, we talked about this, I've mentioned to you four great obstacles that evolution has to overcome right up front before you can ever believe this is, and when you re think about this, you say, man, you do have to have a lot of faith, right? Like, to begin with, cosmic evolution, where did the first material come from? We know that if you have nothing after a million years, you know what you're going to have? Nothing. <laughs> it's not going to change if you don't have anything to begin with. So if you didn't have nothing, then how did the first material come, the first element? And then how did you go from that one element to biochemical evolution, to have all the different kinds of chemicals that you have, 118 of them? How did that happen? And then how do you go from having chemicals to life? That's a pretty big jump, isn't it? I mean, scientists have been trying to do that for years and years in the laboratory and haven't been able to do it yet. So if they can't do it, trying their best, we're supposed to just believe it just happened. Oop, it just happened. And then, of course, you have the biological evolution, perhaps the biggest jump yet. How do you go from having a single cell to nine million different life forms on this planet? Well, that's a pretty big jump. It's kind of hard to imagine that when you start thinking about it. And the more you think about it, the more you realize it. that's just not going to happen. Um, so, wow, did I get this twice? <laughs> Sorry about that. Scientific business is. Am I going the right way? Oh boy. Hold on. I know what happened. I know what happened. This thing went back to the very beginning. As I told you, I'm just figuring out the system, so bear with me. All right. I ran across this on Facebook, and I thought that's basically what I've been saying, right? To be an atheist, I would have to believe nothing produced everything. That's what I said coming to the first material you get from nothing. You don't get something, especially not everything. I'd have to believe non-life produced life, randomness produced precision, and I'd have to believe chaos produced order. Those last two I didn't have, but those are pretty good, right? You look up in the stars, what do you see? Perfect order, and arrangement, predictability. Now this happened by a big bang, right? That's what we've been told. How many of you have ever seen a big bang? Did it look like order and arrangement to you? My son, for a while, got into 
explosives when he was a kid, smaller kid. I know, just makes this is where the gray hairs come from, right? So he decided he got on YouTube or somewhere, found out how to make explosives, and said he would try doing that. And so we had no VCR. He decided he was going to blow it up. And I remember we all got behind trees, and sure enough, I mean, pieces went everywhere. No order, no arrangement. It was just chaos. But we don't see this in our universe, right? A big bang? Why was there not more chaos? Anyway, chaos produces order. It takes faith to believe all that, or wishful thinking, maybe I should say. So, we got down to, I think, the last week to talking about the dating process, and so I want to spend a few moments tonight briefly trying to talk to you about the dating process, and, because it's another problem that evolutionists have, I think. You see, for evolution to occur, remember how we said it happened, it would have to happen, they have to have some method for the, to change it from one species to another. And so their method, the only method they can come up with is mutations. This species, this animal mom has some, for some reason, a mutation. And that trait gets passed on to the youngster, and that youngster passes it on. And then it gets in the line, and so you, you have this new mutation, and then but then you've got to have, I mean, that mutation is not very big, so you've got to have another mutation and then another and then another until you finally have enough mutations that you changed into a new species, a new animal. But as I mentioned to you, if you remember, having a really good mutation that ends up making the species better is very, 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 very rare. Rarely happens. And so if it's rarely going to happen, then you have to have an Earth that's really, 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 really old. It's got to have enough time in there for all these mutations to occur to get 9 million species. That's a long time. And so you have to have some way of dating it to show that the Earth is that old. So I'm going to try to explain this as best I can, given the fact that, and Mike, will, Mike Sullivan, who knows everything, will tell me when I get this wrong. But basically, it's like this. Have you ever siphoned out of a gas tank of your car with a hose and you live to tell about it? <laughs> okay. So you put the hose in there and you siphon it out and you've got a little jug there and it goes up. So let's say you know that the siphon works um, it, and it takes um, 10 minutes for you to get a gallon. You've got a really small hose. So 10, mil 10 minutes to get a gallon of gas. So you get it started and you take off somewhere and you come back and you've got four gallons. So what do you know? And, and by the way, it's not anymore coming out. So you know there was four gallons in the tank, otherwise you would have more than four gallons. And you also know it took how long? 10 minutes per gallon, you got four gallons. It took you 40 minutes, right? And so in four minutes, you got four gallons out of the tank. That's basically the, the same kind of methodology used to date the Earth. They call it the half-life theory. But it's the, it's the same sort of idea. Um, so <laughs> I'm going to use uranium, even though they don't really use uranium anymore, and I'll explain that in a minute. But uranium... Is, uh, as you know, it's like all atoms. It has neutron, proton in the middle, electrons around the outside. And given enough time, it will decay, and it will become another, another element. Anybody knows what it becomes? Lead. Yeah. So given enough time, uranium becomes lead. So what they do is they say, okay, I know the rate at which it's going to become lead, all I have to do is look and see how much lead I've got in my sample. And so I know how long it took for it to become lead, so I know how old the Earth is, right? And so they find this, they say I've got, uh, it took 10 years for a pound of, to get a pound of lead from uranium. And so they, they go away for a while and they come back and they've got three pounds, so that means the Earth must be 30 years old, right? But there's some real problems with this. To 
begin with, they're assuming a closed system. They're assuming that nobody else came along and added more lead or added more uranium. A meteor didn't fall or something else happened to, make the, to change up the percentages. Secondly, they're also assuming the same rate, right? So, what if, go back to my little illustration of the gas, and say it's water instead of gas. Water going into, and I heat up the water, it goes faster, right? Into the little jug. What if I have a, a lot of pressure and a lot of heat, would the rate going, turning into lead be quicker? Maybe. I don't know how that works. Or slower? What about the ice age? So what if back when God created the earth, <laughs> all the pressure and heat and everything else, maybe it was a faster rate? But we don't know what the rate was, but to assume it's constant all of those years, you don't know that. And this is the one I think is the worst. What if at the beginning you had lead and uranium? I mean, you're assuming you can't, say you have, you come back and you, you have three um, pounds of lead there, and so you say, oh, I'm, I must have had, so it took me 10 years per pound, that's 30 years, okay. Um, trying to figure out how to explain this. But let's assume that you had already three pounds and you come back and there's six pounds there, and you say, okay, six pounds, 10 years per pound, that's 60 years, right? Well, wait a minute, you already had three pounds, so it's not 60 years, it's just 30 years, right? What if in the beginning, when God created the worth, world, he already had lead and uranium both there? You can't just come back and say, okay, here's how much lead I've got now, and that's how long it took it to turn from uranium to lead. There was lead there the whole time. It just blows your calculations all out of the water, right? But for these folks that are trying to come up with a long age, they don't really care about that. They want somehow to prove that the Earth is old, and so they just kind of ignore the, the assumptions that are totally out the window and probably wrong. Well, <laughs> they don't use, as I mentioned, uranium and any more <coughs> lead. I think they use phosphorus and argon. Does anybody know now for that dating process? If you're dating bones, they have what they call carbon dating. You've probably heard of that. And carbon dating uses, um, I think it's carbon, I think all bones have carbon-14 and carbon-12. And carbon-14 decays into carbon-12. So the same principle, though, you look at how much of which, and you know how long it takes you to decay. So they find an old bone, and they look at how much is in there, and they say, okay, must have taken this bone, must have been here this many years. But the same problems. They don't know how much it was to begin with. They're assuming it was all carbon-14, or they assume they know what it was. Anyway, so there's a problem here. When it comes to dinosaur, when it comes to carbon dating, it's only good for at most 100,000 years. But the dinosaurs, they say, lived what? 65,000 years before man, 65 million years before man came along? Carbon dating doesn't even go back that far. So how are they gonna know how old the dinosaur bone is? How are they gonna come up with this idea well, it's 65 million years old? If it doesn't, they can't use carbon dating to go back that far. We'll look at the soil, right? Now if you're like me, flags are already gonna, wait a minute. How do we know that the soil wasn't there a long time before the dinosaur came along? And so what they do in particular is they look at how deep the dinosaur bone is in the ground and if it's deep enough in the layer because deeper layers it's going to be older right theoretically and so they say well it's way down here at this deep level so it must be 65 million years old 
Well, let me suggest something else to you. What if there was a worldwide flood? So much for that idea. Have you ever seen any place that's flooded and all the mud that gets left behind? <laughs> so you've got a flood that's on the earth for 40 something, 40 nights and days and nights and after it leaves, I mean, whatever bone dinosaurs died in the flood are gonna be buried in sediment. And then there's more gonna be on top of that over the years that follow. You can't look at how deep it is and tell unless you don't believe in a flood. Which they don't, of course. They begin with this preconceived idea. There's no flood, and so there's no, I can't, I don't have to worry about that. There must be some other explanation. Uh, along those same lines, you can do the same thing with the Grand Canyon, right? How old is the Earth? Well, soil erodes at 12 inches a year. It's not, it's not that fast. Say 12 inches a year. And so in three years, I'm going to have 36 inches deep. And so I look at the Grand Canyon, how deep is it? And so I know how many years it took for it to get down there. And so it's millions of years old. But what if there was a worldwide flood? That changes all that, doesn't it? The water's receding. That would have eroded things like everything. Again, this just becomes, it becomes really impossible for them to date in any sort of real realistic way, the age of the earth. But they want you to believe this because they want somehow desperately to prove evolution. I can tell you how old the earth is. Anybody want to tell me? <laughs> if you guessed about 6,000 years, you're probably pretty close. All right, so. Um, or another way of looking at it, how old is the earth? Five days older than man is, right? God created everything on five days, and he created man, and then he rested on that last day. All right, so let me go on, because I want to get just a bunch more I want to get to. The fossil record, we mentioned the problem here with the fossil, the other problem the evolutionists have is there's no intermediates in the fossil record. If evolution occurred, you would expect, say, between a chicken and a dinosaur, and I know that sounds weird, but that's kind of what they, is it birds that came from dinosaurs or dinosaurs from birds? One or the other. But you would expect a lot of intermediary states, right? You'd be able to go to the fossils and you dig down and you'd find, well, here's one that's kind of, and here's one a little bit more like a, a bird, a little bit more like a bird, and a little bit more like a bird, and then this one is it. And you find all these intermediate states. You know what you find? Nada. <laughs> Nothing. Look all over the world. And you can do that with every kind of animal species you can name. There's just no intermediate transitory transitional states in any species. So in desperation, they say, what about mankind? We'll get one from mankind and show we went from an ape to man and we've got it right and so they start looking for the mankind uh, as a way of showing and proving that it occurred the problem is if they would be honest there's not any more evidence for man trans transitory transitional uh, forms for man than there is for anything else in the fossil record you ever seen that I remember seeing that when I was growing up somewhere along the line in biology class. Well, there it is. There's an ape, he turns into a man. We all know that's science, it's in our biology books. It's factual, right? What they don't tell you is that they found a few little bones here and there and some artist who had no idea what he was doing said, hey, let's make it look like this. And so they drew up a little picture here and drew up this and made that one look a little bit different and came up with all these nice looking pictures, but they have no basis in fact whatsoever. Oh, I thought I'd just throw a little humor in. Get it? No? Never mind. In case you can't read it, these kids today with their crazy upright walking. Supposedly they're evolving and they're starting to walk upright. No longer like the monkeys. 
All right, so. <laughs> you guys are a hard sell. Um, so they, they came out with, they started looking and they found different what they consider to be over the years transitional models or men, people, bones. Well, the first one was called that we call, you've all, all heard of the Neanderthals, right? You may have been called a Neanderthal. Have somebody call, you maybe call somebody else a Neanderthal. And so, one of the first forms they found and um, fossils they found. Um, Neanderthals, however, as they began to, first of all, they portrayed them as bow legged, barrel chested. <laughs> But here's, here's the thing. Maybe they just lived in it. This guy they found just lived in a time where he had some bone disease, right? Maybe they were just plain people, but they had real problems in their digestive system. They came from a harsh inland, the first ones came from a harsh inland environment in Europe where they could easily have suffered skeletal abnormalities, especially from lack of seafood with iodine in the diet and from shortage uh, in the long winters of, uh, of sun-induced vitamin D. And so the reality is their brain volume is slightly larger than the average person's is. It sounds like they're not apes, but people. They came from an area that apparently they were, there was complex speech and that area that was developed. Um, they had well-developed culture, art and religion. Anyhow, this article, by the way, let me just tell you, if you want to read some on your own, there are a couple of websites you can go to. One is called uh, Answers in, Gen Answers in um, Genesis. Is that it? Answers in Genesis, which is not bad. It's not a... I don't agree with everything they've got on there, but it's not a bad place to get some answers. And the other one is our brethren have, of course, one called Apologetics Press. And you can go to both of those on the website, on the internet, and find any answer you want. Okay, so this is from Answers in Genesis. And uh, it says, nowadays, many evolutionists agree completely with creationists. Neanderthals were just plain people. And then along the way, they came up with um, the Piltdown Man. Have you ever heard of that one? In 1912, speculation about man's ancestry shifted to Piltdown. Um, almost everyone knows now that the Piltdown, Piltdown Man turned out to be a deliberate hoax. He wasn't shown to be a hoax until 1950. So for about 40 years, you grew up in school, you were told... This is our missing link. See, that's the problem. They present, pre present this to kids as this is fact. And people grow up thinking that. Almost everyone knows that he was turned out to be a deliberate hoax. Um, the facts in this case turned out to be a bit of eight jaw and human skull stained to make it look older. I got a picture of the jaw and the little... And from that, you get this nice picture of this man that's stooped over walking in his half ape and half man. Okay. Another one that came up with was Nebraska man. <laughs> You're reading ahead of me, so I'm just going to read that. <laughs> was reconstructed family and all from a tooth. Yeah, you got that. They found a tooth. And so they reconstructed what the man looked like. Wait a minute. And then the tooth turned out to be from a pig. And not from a man at all. Joining, this guy writes, joining Neanderthals, blacks, aborigines, and Piltdown man as proposed witnesses for human evolution at the famous Scopes trial in 1925 was Nebraska man. He was dignified by the scientific name, I'm not going to try to pronounce that, but he was never known by anything but a tooth. 
by imagination, a tooth was put in a skull, the skull was put on a skeleton, the skeleton was given flesh hair and a, a family. This is a picture of what the Nebraska man was drawn as in a London newspaper published the year of the Scopes trial. Okay. I can never remember the name of this place, but this is the Oduva Gorge. I know I'm going to make it. But this is, I told you I went to Africa one year and I went to Tanzania and they stopped along the way at this to show us and they had a little amphitheater there where you sit and they give you this spill about Leakey and how he discovered the missing link and all that kind of stuff, which is total nonsense. Leakey went to Africa. I often wondered, why would you go out in the middle of nowhere and just all of a sudden find just the missing link? Wouldn't that kind of strange and odd to you? Well, apparently Darwin said, we all descended from apes. And so he said, well, apes are in Africa. And so he went over to Africa looking for the missing link. And that's where he found it, he, he said. The Old Dubai Gorge. All right. I don't want to go that far. Oh, go back. No, 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 no. Go, go back, go back, go back. All right. Um, there was another one you might have heard of, Lucy. Modern speculation on mankind's ancestry centers on the group of fossils called Australopithecus, Australopithecus. In the public mind, these fossils are especially associated with the work in Africa of the Leakey family and of Donald Johansson and his famous specimen, Lucy. Um, where he finds this, he also finds, it's interesting, Johansson likes to point out that where he finds this, these bones, he also finds many of his regular African animals, rhinos, boas, hippos, monkeys, but never apes. Hmm. Could it be that that was the ape and he just didn't realize it? Maybe. Okay. There are con current candidates for man's ancestor ancestors. Charles Oxnard says the fossils provide a warning against too early, too readily acceptance of this view. He teaches two conclusions. One is scientific. I think I may have jumped ahead. No, nope, I didn't. Okay. He reaches two conclusions. One is scientific. He says if it walked upright, and it has to be walking upright for it to be a missing link. If it walked upright, it was not in a human manner. And the second is he wants people to be more critical. In a PBS TV program on Lucy, Donald Johansson finally contradicted his earlier assertions and admitted that Lucy's pelvis was nearly, was really fit with the idea that she, excuse me, was that Lucy's pelvis never really fit with the idea that she walked upright. So in other words, it was really more like a monkey than a man and never, she never really walked upright because the bones of the pelvis fit too perfectly. So he shows a scientific drawing, a saw, he, excuse me, he shows a sign, scientist sawing up a replica of, of Lucy's pelvis and gluing the pieces back together again. And then he claims that the sawed and glued pelvis shows that Lucy did walk upright. In other words, he made the pelvis be what he wanted it to be so he could prove what he wanted it to prove. All right. All right, I would love to go on with that, but I'm not going to. The bottom line here is simply just to say, when they start looking for these, uh, everyone that they found so far and have come up with, when all is said and done, they turn out to be fake. And they don't, still don't have a missing link Man, now think about this. If, in fact, we've come from apes and we, why aren't there these transitional forms everywhere? You'd be expected to find those, right? And yet they haven't found any that they can prove actually show this. All right. Yeah, just another little humor. This complicates things. Dinosaurs are supposed to be years and years and years and years, millions of years old, and there's another spacecraft there. I'm not sure what that's trying to tell us, but anyway. I w did want to get into dinosaurs just briefly. I've got 10 minutes, okay? 
why would you want to know about dinosaurs? And that was my first question. Who cares? But it's important from a couple of reasons. One is because it's a hook. You want to get young people interested, right? And what do young people love? Dinosaurs. And if you can get them interested in dinosaurs, you can get them interested in evolution, and you can teach them evolution. And so it's a hook that provides a fantastic hook and instant introduction for paleontologists and educators to get their kids involved and interested in science. Similarly, dinosaurs were around for a very long time, and for any kind of study of evolutionary change or diversity over a long period of time, dinosaurs are going to be a good candidate. So we get them into this whole idea of evolution by getting them to think about dinosaurs. Um, the other reason that it's an important thing is because of the time frame, right? Because dinosaurs apparently, live 60, they say they live 65 million years before mankind came along, so you've got to have time for them to change this evolution. So if I can prove that dinosaurs are out there 65 million years ago, then I've got time for my evolution to occur. Nope. Okay, I thought I had a, another slide. So did they exist? You expect it to be stories, right? Well, there aren't any stories about, or maybe there are. Are there stories about dragons? You grew up hearing about dragons, right? Could dragons be dinosaurs? Stories of dragons are found in, in about every culture. Evolutionist Kara Than says, dragons are found in myths and legends of cultures all around the world. Everybody knows about dragons. So here's the thing. The word dinosaur didn't come along until 1840, 1840s. So you're not going to find dinosaur in the Bible because when they wrote the Bible, dinosaur wasn't a word yet. But it's from two Greek words, dinos, and which means fearfully great, and sorrows, which means lizard or reptile. So it's a fearfully great reptile. That could be a dragon, right? I mean, a, a dinosaur, right? And so we have all of these creatures beforehand that could have been called dinosaurs now, but were really just fearfully great lizards. So here's a question. And this comes from uh, surveying the evidence by Jackson, Lines and Butt. What rational explanation exists for the peoples in different places and times separated by thousands of miles all to come up with, with stories of giant reptiles that sound more like extinct dinosaurs than any other animal on Earth? Think about that. I mean, why would all these people all over the world come up with what looks like giant rep fearful reptiles, dragons? Maybe they were all talking about dinosaurs. Some stories probably embellished, no doubt, but there's still some truth there. Okay. Another thing is, oh, here we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Let's start marking my PowerPoint on there. That's what I just read to you. Are there any illustrations? What do you think? Pictures of dinosaurs? Every culture has some record of seeing dinosaurs, pictures. So if you go to the Natural Bridges National Monument in Utah and you look under the Kachina Bridge, these, para, these uh, petroglyph, petroglyphs are dated 500 to 1500 years old. Among them appears to be, what is this, anybody know? Some of you dinosaur people. Yeah, that's what you're going to say, right? Does that look the same? Pretty close, doesn't it? But those pictures are 500 and something. Oh, wrong way. Those pictures are 500 and something years old. How would they know 
500 years ago, before we ever dug up any dinosaurs, what one looked like. Hmm, maybe they did see some. Maybe they weren't all extinct, right? Isn't that interesting? Okay, so, <clears throat> Brontosaurus. Does anybody recognize that? Angor Wat, one of the seven wonders of the world, right? So this is in Cambodia in a place called Siem Rip. And uh, there's a big temple and there are all sorts of temple complexes all around, several of them. Um, <laughs> that's one of them and you, just gotta, you can see the face at the top of the temple. Some of them have faces. And then there are others have trees growing out, so they're kind of different. I don't know who those strange people are though. Ah, look at that young man. He's pointing on one of the temple walls. Look what we look what he's pointing at here. What does that look like to you? Stegosaurus? That's what you were going to say, right? These temples, this one uh, built in 1186, 1,000 years ago, 600 years, long before we ever learned about dinosaurs. So how did they know about that? I thought dinosaurs died out 65 million years before man ever came along. So what does that look like to you? What? Thank you. Well, somebody knows about dinosaurs. That's a triceratops, yeah. So, Dr. Javier, I need a Spanish person to do this for me. Darquea, maybe? D A R Q U E A. Was given a stone for his birthday to use as a paperweight. So he traced down its origin and he found 11,000 of these stones that are burial stones. They were, the Indians placed them in the grave with the dead, and they date from 8,500 to 1,500 years. So they were long before we ever discovered dinosaur bones, right? Stegosaurus? That sure looks like one. I mean, Triceratops, excuse me. Oh, went that too far. Yeah, looks like the same thing to me. This is another one. What does that look like? T-Rex. Here's one that has, it looks like a brontosaurus here, a T-Rex here, a triceratops here, a stegosaurus in the back. How did they know about those? I mean, I thought they died 65 million years before. Well, somebody will ask, why aren't they mentioned in the Bible? I know, you want to go, but I'm, I'm going to hurry. Job 7, verse 12, am I the sea or a sea monster? Well, what's a sea monster? Could it be a plesiosaurus? Maybe. In Isaiah 30, in verse 6, an oracle of the beast of the Negev, through a land of trouble and anguish from where come the lionist and the lion, the adder and the flying fiery serpent. How many of you have ever seen a flying fiery serpent? <laughs> what is a flying fiery serpent? Maybe, what? Maybe a dinosaur, right? That's what you were saying, right? Around Forincus, whatever you have, you pronounce it. Around Forincus. I don't know. Or maybe a, a, a dimorphodon. I mean, it could be telling us all along about the dinosaurs. It's just that 
in the English, in the translation in the English, we kind of lost some of that. And, he, and of course, this is the one you're thinking about right off the bat, right? Job 40. Behold, behemoth, which I made as I made you, he eats grass like an ox. Behold, his strength is in his loins and his power in the muscles of his belly. He makes his tail stiff like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are knit together. His bones are tubes of bronze. His limbs are like bars of iron. He is the first of the works of God. So what is it? That's an elephant, right? Have you ever seen a tail of an elephant? Does it look like a cedar to you? He says he has <laughs> his tail stiff like a cedar, but elephants, they have a little bitty flimsy thing that hangs off the back. And same for hippos, by the way. Maybe it's a dinosaur. Okay. So the whole point of all this is to simply say this. Look. The evolutionists want us to believe it's a fact. But it's not a fact. It's a wishful thinking. Because they don't want to accept the the idea that there's a God to begin with and if you don't accept God you start looking for anything you can come up with to, to explain and so that's Romans 1 right they didn't put God in their knowledge and so they started worshiping the creature more than the creator and that's exactly what men are doing and more concerned about the creature the dinosaur and whatever the evolution than they are the God who made them all and that's sad well I hope at the very least I've gotten you to think a little bit about God and how, if, if nothing else, not just about the fact that evolution is wrong, but how great God is. That our God can do what he's done. Isn't it marvelous to think about these huge animals he made? And um, so many things like that. that I don't know, but for me, <laughs> I think about God is real. I know he's real. And I know one day I'm going to have to give an account to him. And I want to make sure I'm ready for that day. And I hope you do, too. I hope as you think about tonight, your soul and where you're at and in your life, whether or not you've been faithful to God, I hope you'll think about, maybe I need to make some changes and become more the servant that God wants me to be. Because I'm going to have to answer to him one day. Well, whatever we can do to help you, make sure your relationship is right with the Lord. We want to invite you to come while we stand and sing. Two hundred and seventy-two. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back, no turning back. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. No turning back, I'll follow him. Okay, now before we have our closing prayer, 118. Just the first and last verse, 118, 118. When upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one. 
and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. So amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged, God is over all. Count your many blessings, angels will attend. Help and comfort give you to your journeys in. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. Hope everybody has a good night and good rest of the week. Let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day you've given us. We thank you for the opportunities that you give us. Thank you for the blessings you shower upon us and the measure of health that you blessed us with. Thank you for us being able to come here and be here tonight and hear an interesting lesson from Jeff and help us to uh, think about these things and learn more as much as we can about you and your word and be an encouragement to other people that we come in contact with people in our families, friends, co-workers, school. Father, please be with all those on our sick and shut-in lists, those that were mentioned earlier. Please be with Aubrey Cooper as he's dealing with some health issues. Butch Stokes, Walt Lever, please be with Sandra's uh, friend, mother of Mercedes Culligan in uh, Kentucky. Please be with the four hands, be with Nancy and Agnes Harrell, Connie Watts. Please be with anyone, anyone else that I may be forgetting at this time. Please be with my sister. She's healing up from the, her heart attack issue. And pray that will heal up well. Please be with the, the Rutledge family and the Stubblefield family on the losses of John and Jack. Comfort them during this difficult time. Father, be, please be with all those we hear about in the news, tragedies that happen all over our state, our country, and the world. Please bless, be with all of our leaders. Pray that they will look to you for guidance and wisdom. And Father, help us to not forget you, to continue to pray without ceasing. And Father, we thank you especially for Jesus for going to that cruel cross in our place. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.